Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Bio Breakthroughs podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is David Esposito, the president and CEO at ONL Therapeutics. David, how are you today? Hey, Jared, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Excited to have you here. Let's dive right in. Tell the audience a little about you. Sure. So I have about 30 year career in life sciences. Started off my career with Merck, large pharma company, and mostly sales, marketing, commercial strategy roles. Spent about 15 years with Merck and then made a significant pivot in my career, moved into more of the early mid stage of healthcare, uh, ran a couple diagnostic businesses, had a you know, few good early stage uh, exits, also took a few companies into control wind down or painful bankruptcies. It's the nature of it. And I've been the CEO of ONL Therapeutics. We're a mid stage biotech company. I'm working in the phase two studies right now, and uh, we're located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So my career has kind of journeyed through a number of cities in the U.S., but uh, been in Michigan for about the last 12 years or so, running some early stage companies. And give us that that overview of ONL Therapeutics, like what's in pipeline today? What's the status? I, I know our audience would love to hear that. Sure. Uh, so ONL Therapeutics, a traditional kind of university spin out startup. Uh, our technology was developed by our scientific founder, Dr. David Zacks, who's a retina specialist at the University of Michigan. Uh, David identified the relevance of this receptor on, on retinal cells called the FAS, F-A-S, FAS receptor. Uh, that receptor is activated in diseases of uh, or disease or stress states, whether it's glaucoma, conditions like wet or dry age-related macular degeneration, retinal detachment. So that was the scientific underpinnings, and the company was founded a little bit over a decade ago to develop therapeutics that block that FAST receptor. Uh, and so over the course of the typical kind of decade long biotech journey, we raised a little bit of capital to get some preclinical work, develop our lead compound. Our lead compound is a 12 amino acid peptide that's delivered via IVT injection. So we're an injection in the eye, uh, similar to anti VEGF therapies for wet AMD. Uh, developed a lead compound ONL 1204 that over the last four or five years now, we've brought that lead compound through three phase one studies, a condition called retinal detachment, condition called dry age-related macular degeneration, and open angle glaucoma. Those three phase one programs have continued to proceed very well in the clinic. And a few months ago, uh, we opened up our first phase two study in that condition called retinal detachment and acute condition. So we've made good progress in the clinic. We are now, you know, about halfway through our phase one retinal detachment study, in phase two, sorry, retinal detachment study uh, in terms of enrollment. Uh, we hope for, for good outcomes on that. And we've made steady progress in glaucoma and GA. And we're preparing for phase two studies in those. I could give in a lot more specifics, but at a high level, our lead compound's doing really well. And uh, we're rolling into phase two studies. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, based on what you just said, right, and whenever someone takes a look at what you're doing, you're heavily involved in the retinal disease area. Talk us through how that landscape has changed over the last couple of years. Sure. I think, you know, there's, uh, we think broadly around retinal disease, but I'll maybe chip away on some of the specifics within that. You know, the the area of wet age-related macro degeneration that we don't have a clinical program in, we, we certainly could, but we've made some choices away from that. Obviously, the last, you know, 20 plus years, people have been used to treating that condition with anti-VEGF therapies, and that's been a large growing market with, uh, you know, really sizable patient bases and, you know, in, in real large clinical programs in that. Uh, the three conditions that we focused in on, so first is with regards to the evolution in maybe the last couple of years, and your audience is probably very familiar with the condition of dry age-related macular degeneration, the advanced form being geographic atrophy. There has never been an approved therapy, you know, uh, over the course of years, a lot of people have tried, but this year was the first approval uh, company of Pellis of a complement, anti-complement therapy uh, that got approved back in uh, February or so. 
and uh, another uh, company, Iveric Bio, that recently got uh, acquired by Estellis, or is in the process of that, most likely to get approved here in a few months. So the, the area around retinal disease, specifically to dry AMD, where patients have just been on a slow, steady path to blindness, now this year with the emergence of one, most likely two approved therapies, we are in that space as well, but that has changed dramatically certainly for those patients and, and the retina specialists that treat them with the emergence of these therapies. We, we hope to be moving into a phase two study in that condition of geographic atrophy soon um, and hope to be part of the mix to make a real difference in patients who, as I mentioned, hadn't had a therapy, uh, an, an approved therapy for a while. So that, that's, that's beginning to change the landscape, I think, Jared, when we look at investment in new technologies, that certainly has been where the last handful of years it has been. And then the, the third area, uh, you know, or other area I'll just briefly describe is, is in glaucoma. You know, the, the focus on glaucoma has really been around lowering intraocular pressure. Um, we have a pressure independent treatment to protect ganglion cells, our lead compound ONL1204. And so we feel in terms of the landscape in glaucoma, it has been focused on either, uh, therapeutics or surgeries to lower intraocular pressure. We're fundamentally changing the game from a neuroprotective agent. And we think that can really change the landscape for glaucoma in a while. But those are maybe a couple areas of evolution in the areas of retina disease. And I think most prominently recently is the approval of therapies to treat geographic atrophy, which have not existed for a while. So what, what excites you the most about what you're doing at ONL Therapeutics as it relates to, you know, the, the future of, of this space? You know, I think it's, uh, it's real purposeful work that we're involved in. I mean, I've, I've uh, led a few cancer diagnostics companies in the past, and, you know, that's a, a tremendous disease burden on patients, certainly across the globe. But when we think about vision protection, uh, people genuinely fear going blind. And there hasn't been a lot of therapeutic advances to hopefully slow that progression to blindness. So we feel like we're in real purposeful work in trying to bring therapeutics to the market that can help patients protect their vision. We have a, uh, you know, our, our vision of the company is to help patients literally see the future. And um, so that that's the exciting work we have. I think what we've been really focused in on is uh, our mechanism of action around blocking this FAST receptor has applicability across a number of disease states. We, we saw that preclinically in our animal models, and now we're seeing it translate into our human studies, whether it's retinal detachment, geographic atrophy, or open angle glaucoma. We're seeing the potential to make a meaningful difference to protect those patients' retinal cells, regardless of the stress or disease that they're under, to hopefully protect their vision for years to come. And so that that's the exciting thing that gets us going. It's it's never easy raising capital to do that, never easy to execute clinical trials, but we're a small team, but accomplishing a lot of great work. And that's what that has us super excited about the future of what we can make a difference in what are really challenging disease states out there. Now, an almost unavoidable topic, David, that you can't walk down the street without hearing, no matter what its application is, is the topic of, around AI. Yeah. How, how do you see AI you know, and machine learning? What, what is its role in, in your, maybe like the biotech space in general, but just overall, uh, how do you see it you know, helping, hurting? Where, where do you see that going? No, I think, uh, you know, I had some um, part of my history after leaving Big Pharma with Merck was to get into the more early and mid stage of medical diagnostics. So that was kind of the front runner of real early application of machine learning or artificial intelligence in terms of disease state predictability. You know, looking at a bunch of uh, endpoints, whether it's basic demographics plus kind of a uh, biomarker samples to really try to optimize predictability of disease in one of my company's predictability of risk of prostate cancer or lung or breast cancer. So 
I think those have really evolved over time in the diagnostic space to really support patient identification. I think in the, in the near term from a therapeutic space in my role today with o and and what we see the role of AI or machine-based learning is, is certainly around patient identification that could best benefit from our therapies. You see a lot of AI work going on in terms of the dry AMD geographic atrophy space in terms of lesion identification, predictability of growth of rapid disease progression of, of those lesions. And so I think that that is a real clear opportunity for machine learning today is really identify in a, in a condition like dry AMD that typically has a historically long, slow progression and very difficult to predict those patients that will progress faster versus others. We've seen the advent of some of these um, machine learning artificial intelligence companies to take a whole you know, group of various data sets and optimize to be able to predict rapid progression of disease, which um, beneficial for you know, uh, physicians to understand that for patients, but as, you know, drug developers to be able to perhaps identify patient progression uh, to, to identify the right patients to enter, say, a clinical trial to show a benefit quicker than, than perhaps they would otherwise. So, I, you know, it's obviously out there. It is the buzzword out there. We're trying to be as, as practical as we can use it. And I think where we are today is, boy, can we identify faster progressing patients that could benefit from our therapy. That that's really where our focus has been. Yeah, I think it it'll provide a lot of good. But I I appreciate you not plastering it all over your your website like so many people do. And in their <laughs> it's it's almost the equivalent of like when you're looking at pitch decks years ago with like blockchain too. It was like even if someone had no application for it, they'd throw it in there because it you know was with the times. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, thank you for for that. Uh, that those insights. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll, you know, we'll see how it evolves. I mean, I think, you know, it, it comes down to at least a lot of the tools that we've seen to date is uh, you got to aggregate uh, these databases to get some real power in terms of numbers. And, you know, the, the challenge for all of us in healthcare is, um, you know, we, we have a data aggregation problem. There's that, there's certainly a, a tremendous amount of data, but it's in various formats and in our clinical trial world, various different EDCs. And to really leverage the power of some machine learning, you, you need some thoughtful integration of that data. And that, that, takes a, that takes a lot of brain power and a lot of computing power to be able to do it, unfortunately. Absolutely. Um, my last question for you, David, before we, we, we let you go is what's next for, for the company? Sure, Jared. Great question. We're excited about what we have down the road. I mean, I mentioned uh, we're in a phase two study in retinal detachment. Uh, we're excited about seeing enrollment continue to move forward, and we hope to be producing top line, top line results about a year from now in that study. So that that's kind of on the forefront, boy, a phase two readout, top line results within 12 months. Uh, it's one we're really focused on on making that work. The second piece is we just recently had our meeting, uh, a meeting with the FDA to help set up our parameters for our phase two study in geographic atrophy. And so we came away with that meeting with some real possibilities on how we could enter the GA space with a phase two study. So we're going to spend the next six months uh, optimizing the right clinical trial design, find the right CRO partner, uh, work with the right key opinion leaders to get that study off and running. We hope you know, in the early part of next year. So those are the two, you know, big areas. First and foremost, I think the, the third area that we hope uh, in the not too distant future is to make really good progress in our work in open angle glaucoma. Um, it was our third phase one study that we started. So it's third in line in terms of the data generation. But so far, the data looks positive, And, you know, we hope to be also preparing a phase two study in glaucoma in the not too distant future. So that that's the exciting part of it. I think the the only bookend to that piece that I'd highlight for you is we got to raise the capital to get those phase two programs going. So we're looking for a series D round. We're actively talking to venture folks and strategics about, you know, funding that phase two study in GA. And um, uh, we, we got to raise that capital, make it work. So that that's the, on our backs to make it happen. 
Well, uh, David, I'm super happy that you were able to come on the podcast today, share you know, an overview of the company and, and your insights and some of the things happening in the industry. Hopefully we can have you come back on and, and we can dive into some more stuff, but really appreciate you being a guest here today. Jared, thanks for bringing me on, letting us tell the ONL story. Appreciate your generosity in doing that. No, I look forward to uh, discussions down the road. Mm-hmm.